And on today's show, how to overcome client procrastination, part three of this week's series on industry trends that will change the financial industry with nationally recognized top industry consultant, Chuck Hollander. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day three, Chuck. All right. I'm in Stunsville after the last <laughs> two days. Yeah. I don't know about you if you've been watching this. If you have come back, if you're just catching us down on Wednesday, I need you to go back out and watch Monday and Tuesday show in succession. We believe you're going to really get it through the chronology or the building blocks of Monday and Tuesday show. We really walk through some things. This is for our benefit of our practice. Now, client procrastination. Oh my gosh. Uh, generally, most of us in the industry blame the client for this. Yeah, yeah. You know, you you're he's just stalling, he's deferring, he's delaying. Yeah. And when I first heard you speak, you said, uh, the person who's causing client procrastination is you, the producer. I was yeah. like, what? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's two reasons. And for if you take all the cases you've ever worked on, they got stalled or the client procrastinated, they didn't go forward. There's two reasons. <clears throat> and if you don't know these two reasons, that's a that's a problem to begin with. Because your number one skill set in this business is to motivate clients to take action on your advice so you can create value for them. If they don't take action on your advice, you're not creating value for them. So two reasons why cases don't get don't move forward. Number one, they didn't see the problem being big enough to do something about. Think about that carefully. They didn't see the problem being big enough to do something about. If that's the case, then why did we present a solution? We mm -hmm. presented it too early. We'll talk about timing. Number two, they didn't believe the solution would work. Well, that's a little more complicated. That one doesn't fit so squarely in the box. And we'll talk about that one as well. Well, walk me through this kind of stepping stone of why these things, no second meeting. Yeah. Stalled deals, never placed. So if you can picture the triangle, that's the playing field. This is where we operate. You got the advisor and the consumer, the buyer and the seller. And we typically start this far apart. <laughs> so on, we talked about in the earlier session, if you lack client or lack differentiation, your con sales conversations are lacking differentiation, you look similar. If you look similar, you're substitutable. If you're substitutable, it doesn't matter whether they engage you or a Merrill Lynch advisor, whether they stay where they're at or move towards your firm. It doesn't matter. You're substitutable. Mm -hmm. If you're substitutable, you lack a competitive advantage. And being in a business in a selling environment, that doesn't make selling easier. It makes it harder. So we lose about 35% of the cases right up front by lacking differentiation. What we're talking about today is stalled deals. Everybody's got a stalled deal in their pipeline. I want you to take your stalled deals and take a little mat and pencil and paper out and start adding them up. Add them up the past 12 months, add them up in the past 24 months. My question is how long has this been happening? Most likely it's more than 24 months. Mm -hmm. There's a big cost here. Stalled deals is not a cost of doing business. Stalled deals is not, well, you win some and lose some. It's a, it's a numbers game. Stalled deals you can control. Let's talk about how we can control that. Number one, the fact is there's a point in time when the probability of a sale is at its absolute highest. If you miss that point in time, you compromise a perfectly good deal. Your number one skill set is to motivate people to take action. That's probably the first time you've ever heard that. There's a point in time in your sales process where the probability that customer, that client, that prospect taking action is at its absolute highest. You need to know when that is and you need to be able to position for it quickly and efficiently. And if you present too early or too late, you compromise a perfectly good deal. That's the effect of a stalled deal. How did you, you know, I know you've been in this thing a long time, you've, you've sold some of the biggest cases. How did you come up with this to identify these points? Uh oh, I've, I'm too early, I'm too late, I'm not at the optimal. Well, I've become a student. I, I, I'm a black belt in you know, my core competency and that's motivating people to take action. And you know, I was brought up in one of the greatest schools mm -hmm. this, the industry's ever had. And, um, and that school was the school of Sid Friedman. Mm -hmm. You know, Sidney mm -hmm. um, took sales as a sacred business activity. And it's not something you, you, you went out and you didn't wing it, you were always prepared, you role played, what could possibly get go wrong? And I've probably been through a dozen different sales training courses and achieved the proficiency level as well as the instructors. So it was embedded in me a long time ago with Sydney that um, this is your sacred you know, skill set. I mean, so this thing is really, I mean, this is the most important thing. If you're out here trying to actually expand your practice, <laughs> yeah, man. we're not even talking See, about what it. what you do, if you, Sidney once said, he said, Chuck, 
you don't, you're not good enough to get paid for, for talking, you know, <laughs> right? So think about this. We're the only profession that if you come in second place, you don't get paid. We just got done watching the Super Bowl last weekend or two weeks ago, right? The losers, Denver, right? They got paid for coming in second place. They lost. Not in our business. You come in second place in this business, you don't get paid. And think of now the time and energy that's put into a sales cycle. When I started, a sales cycle might be an hour over someone's kitchen table. It might be two hours if I decided to stay and have coffee. Now think of the time and energy. It's, it's long and it's expensive. You can't afford to lose a deal through procrastination. Fact is, presentations too early in, in, in the sales cycle are a waste of time. Everybody can relate to proposal safaris, underwriting safaris, and unpaid advice. <laughs> We go, when we go back from the break, I want them to break down these safaris. I bet we've been on journeys we never thought we were on. We'll yeah. be right back in about 30 <laughs> seconds. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the Informed Risk Guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. Chuck, yeah. let's talk about the safari because I... <laughs> <laughs> Which one? I mean, well, let's do proposal safari since I've, I've been down that journey many times. I'm so sorry to say. Yeah. Talk about that, but then we'll get into underwriting. So a proposal so far is where we're spreadsheet and we're running proposals and we're going to take these out into the field to show this prospective buyer how these things work, how an idea works. Um, and typically we've rushed to proposal and we haven't done a good enough diagnosis. So the client hasn't even determined whether there's a problem. If they have, they haven't determined how how big the problem is, and who's impacted, what are the consequences. So we're running proposals way too early in the sales cycle. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they fall on deaf ears. Mm. It creates procrastination. Well, going right after that, underwriting safaris. Now, you know, I have what I thought that means. I'm really anxious to hear what you think that is. This is even worse. So this is where an, an advisor actually will submit an application. Submit an application, get the the prospective buyer to take an, an exam, collect their APS, et cetera, and they haven't committed to purchasing the insurance. They have not acknowledged that, yeah, I've got a problem. I've, I, don't, I, I wanna fix these consequences. We're submitting them way before the, they've actually decided to buy. And I'm gonna take you through hmm. um, a, a schematic so you can determine the point in time so you're not submitting them too early. I mean, think about this, 30%, and, and, and with many institutions, it's higher. This is 30% of premium that's never even converted to company revenue. Mm -hmm. This is not an advisor problem. This is both a corporate problem and an advisor problem. Mm -hmm. And that does not need to happen. That's, as that's, a, that's a symptom of a flawed sales process. Well, the one that really got me is your conclusionary one. And by the way, all this went unpaid. Yeah. So oh, it'd be your great if it was just our advice, but right. it's not. You have underwriters who are, are, are very talented, very expensive. You have advanced marketing people. Mm -hmm. You have people in your own office. I mean, the list goes on. So here, here are three, a couple things to remember. <clears throat> Excuse my typo. Principle one, get before you give. It's, it's the only time that it's okay to get before you give. Usually you give before you get, right? So... <clears throat> The sale is actually made out here. These are triangles. I got this from Sydney. Sydney used to draw these triangles. And the, over here in that circle is that where the buyer and seller, they'd spend about 10% of their time. And then the buyer and seller would come out here. They're miles apart. It takes, it represents the distance they are from each other. They're not on the same page. It represents the time it takes to close the deal, which many of them never close. And the new paradigm is what Sydney would suggest is that you start here, the buyer and seller, but you end up together. And here, if you flip to the next slide, the paradigm here is getting information. So you're spending 90% of your time getting information. Over here, we rush to presentation. Mm -hmm. We rush 
to run the proposals. Can I stop here? I, yeah. I, I think sometimes we feel as advisors that we're obligated to pontificate on the knowledge base that we have. You're exactly right. A lot of advisors, I watch this predominantly on the, on the more technical advisors, they believe they're creating value by delivering lots of information. And it's not. It's not value until, and we're going to go over this in one of my slides, until they understand the problem, the consequences of the problem, who's impacted, and why they should change. So we rush this, and we come out here, and we spend 90% giving our information. What we want to do is spend 90% of our time understanding the client, understanding the cost if the client doesn't move forward, the consequence if they don't mm -hmm. move forward, and communicating that together with them. Mm -hmm. when, you, when they understand that, urgency happens in the sales cycle. You eliminate procrastination. And out here, you're at the, 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 um, the point of presentation. So here's my question. <clears throat> you're in the business of motivating people to change. <clears throat> what are the decisions that your prospects need to make between the time they meet you for the very first time and the time that they hire you? What are the questions or the answers to the questions that your prospects need to have between the time they meet you and the time that they become or sign up, become a client of yours? If you don't know those questions, you're operating at a severe disadvantage. You're in the sales business. You need to know what these questions are. So think about it. <clears throat> Number one, the customer wants to know, do I have a problem? Number two, how big is the problem? Number three, who's impacted? Number four, what are the consequences of not fixing the problem? And then and only then are they, they, they prepared or you've empowered them to answer, do we want to fix it? So think about this. You walk into a meeting. <clears throat> you mentally put this new framework that you come in and say, okay, this business owner is pretty busy. They want to know the following from me. And they're going to say it. Pretend that they're actually going to say it. Okay, mm -hmm. Chuck, you got five minutes to tell me about a problem I don't already know about or an opportunity that I'm missing. I want you to communicate how big it is, who's impacted, and what are the consequences. And if you do that for me, then I'll be able to determine whether I want to buy your stuff or not. And how long does that take? It, 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 this could take a while, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the 90%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what you have to have in order to determine whether somebody can take mm -hmm. action or not. And here it is. Everybody needs evolve over time. So <clears throat> you're satisfied, you're aware of the problem, decision to fix, explore alternatives, and then you take action. At one point, everybody's satisfied. The second point is you've become aware of a problem. You decide to fix the problem because I don't want to deal with these consequences. And then once you decide to fix it, what are my alternatives? So here it is. This is what I want you to take out in the field. Every meeting, you need to ask yourself, where's my prospect on this compass? Are they satisfied with their current situation? Or are they aware that they've got a tax problem? Are they aware that they don't have um, employees, that the employees that they can walk out and they don't have golden handcuffs, a way to reward and retain these people? Are they satisfied or aware? And then have they decided to fix? They've only decided to fix if they understand the problem, how big is it, what are the consequences, and who else is impacted. Once they understand that, then they can decide go or no go, hmm. fix or not fix. If you present before 6 o'clock, if you present, take an under application or proposals, you're wasting, you're compromising a good deal. Here they decide to fix, now we run proposals. Mm -hmm then we get into design and, and trying to fix it. Once they des decide how, then we go into underwriting. You can see if you present before six o'clock, that's how you get underwriting safaris and, and proposal safaris. Wow. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas you hear from us, always consult your tax advisor, legal counsel, or your broker dealer compliance officer. And don't forget, you can view any of our past episodes at downtobusiness.ashbrokers.com. And remember, you could be wise as an Ash Brokerage Advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you tomorrow.